guide us into worship this day. O God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. Let me invite everyone to please stand at this time for our invocation and please remain standing for our opening hymn of praise. Mr. Tim Grady, would you lead us as we pray, please? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for the privilege and the blessing of being in your house once again. We thank you for the revival of spring and the, the reunion of Easter and the meaning of Easter for this time of year. May we hear your message through the pastor's words and song and apply it to our daily life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 329. Please join us as we sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
morning, everyone, and welcome. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, this first Sunday in spring, uh, we do welcome it, and hopefully it will be warmer as we exit this place uh, than it was as we entered earlier today. It is good to see all of you. Please uh, take a moment, look over the opportunities for the week uh, that we have to participate in the life of the church. A couple of things we want to highlight. Uh, first off, uh, Party of Tables is right around the corner today. Technically the last day to sign up uh, for a table uh, if you would like to sponsor one. We are running a little bit short on the number of tables that we have. Uh, considering the years past. So if you've been thinking about doing one and uh, you need a little extra push, uh, please see Marilyn Parker today and go ahead and sign up for those. We uh, always look forward to this event and would like to add a few more uh, to help us with that event that day. Also, uh, softball season is right around the corner. We are signing up folks for our church softball league. There is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. We would love to have your name added to that, and we'll be getting more information out to you. Uh, that is just, as I said, right around the corner. Had a wonderful year last year. Everybody who participated, I think, enjoyed themselves. Uh, and then we did, in our bracket, win uh, the championships. So we're very proud of all those who played, uh, not just for the uh, the camaraderie and for the competition uh, and the fellowship, uh, but it is also a time and opportunity, as Tim Grady said in his prayer, to apply the lessons of Scripture to our daily lives, whether it's at work or at school or in our community, on a softball team, a baseball team, uh, playing music, whatever aspect of our lives we participate in, to have Scripture permeate our lives and become a part of our lives. So we hope you'll join us for that. Also, we are uh, looking towards our Blackfeet Nation uh, 5K uh, run walk, which is right around the corner. That comes the first Saturday in May. Uh, we do have sign-up sheets for that if you would like to participate, either as a runner or a walker, or if you would like to volunteer. Uh, we always can use extra help with that to make sure everything runs smoothly. So we also have forms for that in the foyer this morning. We are glad that you are here. It is good to be in this place as we have come to worship this day, as we continue on our Lenten journey, and as we worship and praise God. Won't you stand and welcome one another this morning? Good morning. Does anybody know what these are? Emojis. emojis. What are emojis for? Expressing feelings. Good. What? But like, why specifically these? Like, you can use different faces for stuff. But what? What are special about emojis? 
Well, you use them in like text messages and stuff like that. Um, so you guys are going to explain which um, emotions are each emoji. Can y'all hold up? Grab the first one. Grab the first one. No, the first front one. Yeah. What is that one? Angry. Okay. You can pass them down if you want. Love. What is Sad. Happy. Happy. Scared. All right. I have a special one. This one I use a whole lot whenever I'm texting Mr. Josh. <laughs> the eye roll. It's true, right? <laughs> I say all the time. I'm like, mm. But um, so how would you feel? We're not going to use this one. How would you feel? Which emotion would you use if somebody like gave you a piece of candy or something? Happy. happy. Where's the happy one? Here, you can hand the two of them to him. Where's the happy face? There's the happy face. What if somebody gives you some money or does something else nice for you? How do you feel? Happy. Okay, so what if somebody is mean to you at school or your brother or sister, your brother or sister is not very nice to you? You'll be mad. Where's the angry face? Show the angry face. And sad. Yeah, sometimes I choose the eye roll too. <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> um, what if somebody stole something from you? Would that make you really happy? Make you angry? Somebody show the angry face. The angry face. Um, what other kind of things would maybe make you angry that somebody, something could do to you? If they're annoying. So if somebody did something good to you, that doesn't make you really happy, right? Right? Um, so it's, a, it's understandable to be angry when somebody does something bad to you, whether it's somebody being mean to you or says really mean things to you or about you. Um, but Jesus, what does he teach us how to, how to handle people that maybe make us angry? Delilah. Be nice back to them. Um, yeah, he teaches us to forgive and to love those people anyways, right? Even though that they might deserve for us to be mean to them, right? That... But Jesus tells us that we should be nice to them and love them anyways. Um, in the Bible, it says that before we believe in Jesus, that we are enemies of God. Why are we enemies of God? Why we're, because, we don't know him because we don't know him yet. But why are we enemies? What makes us enemies of God? Because we are sinners, right? All of us are sinners. Can I get a raise of hands of who all are sinners in here? <laughs> um, so, but Jesus, even though we were his enemy, he chose to go to the cross and die for our sins. He did that for all of us. Um, why would he do that? Because he, loves us. because he loves us that much. And that should make us really happy that somebody loves us that much, that even though that we are, sin we are enemies of somebody, that he would love us that much individually, little kids, adults, it doesn't matter, that he would go to the cross for us and choose to die for us. I and mean, he makes the choice. He knew, that he knew what he was getting into. He knew what his, his job was whenever he got here. Um, so that's a whole lot of love, right? Um, so when, something that, when someone does something that makes us angry or sad, God doesn't want us to get them back, right? We shouldn't retaliate and like go be mean back to them, even though we might want to. Who, 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 who wants to do that? Sometimes you feel like you want to on the inside, right? But Jesus teaches us not to do that. So we have to be different on the outside, even though we might want to and they might deserve it. We have to show them love the way Jesus loved us, right? So you don't necessarily have to be best friends with them. Even if somebody's mean to you, you don't have to be their best friend, but you still got to love them. And what's the best thing that you could do for somebody that maybe is mean to you and that maybe did something? What, there's another thing, though. You can give them a compliment. That's a good one. Teach them about Jesus. You can pray for that person, too. It tells us in the Bible that we need to pray for our enemies. Um, and so when we do these kind things instead of, you know, trying to get somebody back, you know, and being mean back to that person, when we show them kindness, even though they did something mean to us, and we love that person anyway, and we pray for them, that's what separates us as Christians from other people that don't necessarily believe in Jesus. That kind of love, even though that somebody was mean to us or bad to us, that's what makes us different from other people. <laughs> 
Okay, so our love and forgiveness to other people should separate us from, from the rest of the world, right? Um, and that makes God really happy. Where's the happy face? So that makes God really happy when we can forgive and love other people the way that he loved us because we probably didn't deserve all that kind of love from Jesus, but he gave it to us anyway, right? And we should be really happy and do that for other people. All right. You like chickens? <laughs> Me too, bud. <laughs> all right, let us pray. Lord, thank you for all your blessings and mostly for loving us so much that you sent us Jesus to forgive our sins. We surely don't deserve it, but we really do appreciate it. So help us. Love you and other people with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. As we pray today, we have uh, several families we especially ask that you remember in your prayers. Uh, we want to remember this morning the family of Thelma Johnson, uh, who passed away yesterday. Of course, Miss Thelma was Jeff Johnson's mom. Uh, that family has been touched by grief uh, twice now over the last three months. Uh, so please lift them up this morning. As we find out arrangements for Miss Thelma, uh, we'll pass those along to the congregation. Also, please remember the family of Mr. Stanton Massingill. Uh, Mr. Massingill passed away unexpectedly yesterday, and we lift up that family this morning. And then also the family of Mr. James Alexander III, uh, our neighbor across the way, uh, the family that's actually living in Julie's house, uh, old house right now. Uh, this was her dad, and so we lift up that family as well. Also, Roy Turner is going to be having a procedure on Thursday of this upcoming week. Uh, we lift up Roy in our prayers. Would you please bow with me as we pray this morning? Oh Lord, we praise you this morning for who you are. As you have revealed yourself to us as Father and Son and Spirit. In showing us yourself, you have shown us how much you love us and the lengths to which you would go to redeem us, save us, and make a relationship with you possible. We thank you for allowing us to come to you, O oh Lord, when we have needs in our lives, when we have those around us who need our prayers. And so today we confess to you that we do not know what is best for individuals or families that are involved. Lord, we confess to you that oftentimes we don't even know what's best for ourselves. And so this morning we turn to you in trust and ask that your will and your way would be done in each life. Not only the lives of those who are mourning this day, but also the lives of those who are facing procedures or who have recently had procedures and are on the road to healing. We continue to lift up our shut-ins, whether they are at the nursing homes around our community or at home this day. May your will and your way continue to be accomplished in their lives. We thank you, Lord, for loving us enough that you would send your Son into the world to save us. And as we focus on his sacrifice through this Lenten season, may we realize that in his calling to follow him, that indeed you've asked all of us to make sacrifices ourselves. To turn loose of the old people that we were and to take on the new spirit of Jesus Christ. To turn loose of the old way of thinking which guided us for many years and to take upon ourselves the mind of Jesus Christ. 
to let loose of the feelings that seem to guide us every day and oftentimes enslave us and help us to feel as Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the new life. We thank you for the spirit of restoration and renovation. We thank you that you've come into the world and allowing us to improve our souls. So now, O oh Lord, as we remember and recite together the prayer that Jesus taught us, may we remember it's not just words that we say. It's not just a beautiful prayer that we pray, but they truly are words of transformation, making us new from the inside out. As we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> The offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 208. Please stand as we sing. Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning to the beauty of your creation, for bringing us here, enabling us to come here. We thank you, Lord, for all that you give to us that enables us to give back. Bless these gifts and the givers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Last Sunday morning, as we began the first part of our series of soul improvement, we looked at the ways in which our minds are transformed into the minds of Christ. Part of that, Dallas Willard, the author of the book we'll be referring to over the next few weeks, says this is accomplished is by taking Scripture into ourselves, not just reading it, not just thinking about it or studying it, but actually allowing the words of Scripture to permeate our very selves, our very being, our very souls. Part of that, Willard says, is accomplished by memorization, by memorizing large chunks of Scripture that we recall to memory. They come to our minds, literally, as we face decisions we make each day and as we face how we walk in this world. That's not only accomplished, Willard says, by individually spending time with Scripture, committing it to memory, but also corporately as a congregation, taking up the Word of God and reading it as a group, as a body of believers, and allowing those words to sink into ourselves. So this morning, for our scripture reading, we're going to do this a little different than we normally do. Each Sunday morning, you're always invited to, if you have a Bible, turn to a particular passage of scripture or find it on a digital device that you might have with you or pick up the pew Bibles you find in front of you and turn to that page and follow along. Now, every Sunday morning when you're invited to do this, every one of us come to the text more than likely from a different translation. Sure, some of them will be similar, but more often than not, they will be different. And yet all of them, as we understand them, are God's Word. But this morning, so we're all literally on the same page, I want to invite you to take your pew Bibles from in front of you and turn to page 922. Page 922. We will together read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Again, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, found in your pew Bible, page 922. Let us read together. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. May God add the richest of blessings to the reading of the Word this day.
Thank you, choir. Before we jump into the sermon this morning, I want us to do what I often refer to as a gut check. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to your neighbor for just a few moments, and I want you to ask your neighbor this question and have a moment to talk about it, each of you taking a turn. Ask them this question. How are you feeling? Okay? On the count of three. One, two, three, go. Okay, thank you. Thank you for doing that. I just want to make sure everybody's doing okay this morning before we jump into the sermon time. Uh, my guess is, just because we didn't have a lot of time to share with each other this morning, that you probably got an answer of, I'm doing pretty good, I'm feeling fine, everything's going great. Uh, hopefully you said you're glad to be here, enjoy the sunshine. Uh, but really, are you feeling fine? Are you doing okay? Are things going well? Are you really glad to be here? We've come as a society to allow how are you feeling to be one of those courtesy expressions, those courtesy questions that we ask individuals just in a quick interaction with them. It's come to the place of how are you feeling equals hello, have a good day, it's good to see you. Now, more often than not, when we ask somebody how they're feeling, we really want them to respond back. I'm feeling great, feeling fine, everything's wonderful. Because what we don't have time for is for somebody to tell us how they're feeling. Because feelings are powerful. Feelings are powerful. Think about how feelings have a sway over you. Now, if you were honest this morning with each other, and hopefully maybe you were, when you asked the other person, how are you feeling, they could have said, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm depressed, I'm excited, I'm sad, I'm joyous, depending on how your team has done in the NCAA tournament this weekend. There's emotions that we can't even count that we really can't even name, and yet we experience them. That's the, that's the power of feelings. And when I'm talking about feelings this morning, I'm defining them as Dallas Willard defines them in his book, Renovation of the Heart. Willard says that, that feelings, kind of as an all-encompassing category, are made up of emotions, sensations, hungry, or when you touch a person and you feel them, emotions and sensations, and what he refers to as desires. That really we can't define feelings completely. We really do not have an explanation of them, and yet when we feel something, we know it. We know when we're angry. We know when we're sad. We know when we're happy. We know when we're hungry or when we've overeaten and we're full. We know when we're hot or when we're cold. We know when we're depressed. We know all of these things because feelings have such a power over us. Feelings are important to us as human beings. And interestingly enough, feelings are important to our souls. Now, I've always heard in the classes I've taken and in the courses I've participated that really feelings are neither good nor bad. They just are. And that is actually true. Oftentimes, we have no control over the feelings that we have or Rather, let me say, sometimes we have no control how, over how feelings hit us. As you've already heard this morning in the children's sermon, 
the thing that differentiates Christians from non-Christians, from believers from non-believers, from followers of Jesus Christ specifically, to non-followers of Jesus Christ, is that when these feelings, these emotions, sensations, desires wash over us, we, in response to them, do have control. That's why in Willard's book, he talks a little bit about thinking and feeling being part of our mind, which makes up one of the elements, one of the facets of our soul. Because mind and feelings go intimately together. We not only feel feelings deep down within us, we feel them with our mind and we respond to them with our mind. That's why feelings are so very, very important. So this morning in the passage of Scripture we've read again today talking about us living under the mercy of God, presenting our bodies, and we'll have time to talk about body in a few weeks as an expression of our soul, present our bodies as living sacrifices, having our minds transformed our thinking, and our feeling. Feelings are tremendously powerful over us. We realize the influence they have in our lives. How many of you, when somebody says something the wrong way to you or upsets you, anger washes over you like a wave, you really do not know where it has come from, but suddenly it is like something that has overwhelmed you, that has taken you over. How many of you, when you have heard news that is tragic or sad, suddenly have a wave of sadness wash over you, and maybe even leading to the point of tears? You see, we not only respond with our minds to the feelings that we have, we respond with our bodies as well. Just think about Jesus Christ. As the Gospel writer Luke records for us, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, His prayer to the Father that God's will would be done, not His will, but God's will would be done. As He's praying that prayer, the anxiety that washes over Him, perhaps the fear that washes over Him, the determination of the prayer that washes over Him, leads to Him perspiring drops of blood. Feelings are very powerful. Feelings, as you know, can lead us making wrong decisions. Feelings, as you know, can lead us down wrong paths. Feelings, as you know, can lead us to dead ends. A few weeks ago, I read some new statistics. They're from 2017. They remind us of the power of feelings. According to the Center for Disease Control in the United States, in the year 2017, the United States experienced the highest number of suicides in over 50 years. The highest number of suicides in over 50 years. And in that same statistic, they said the second leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 35, the second leading cause of death is suicide. Now, of course, it doesn't break those numbers down and get into the explanation of why these individuals were at the point where they felt the answer was, the response was to take their own lives. We do not have that data. But how many of us know individuals or have read about individuals, or perhaps even experienced ourselves the feelings that could lead to such a decision, the emotions that wash over us that would lead to such an answer, the powerful sensations, emotions, desires that would wash over us that would make us feel that is the right response. 
We live in a nation that is so blessed in so many ways, so rich, so prosperous. We talk about individuals having popularity or having individuals that watch them on YouTube or other social media aspects. We can communicate with each other in ways that we have never dreamed of. We should be in a time where relationships are being built like they've never been built before, where people get to know each other better than they've ever known them before. But something has gone amiss when people feel lonely, depressed, isolated by themselves that lead to decisions that I've listed today. And this doesn't elicit the fact that that number from 2017 tells us about those individuals whose answer to those feelings was suicide. What about those who over-medicate with prescription medications or alcohol or you name your drug, that's the way they ease their pain. This doesn't account for all of those individuals who have feelings of loneliness and they're trying to come up with responses that are not healthy for their bodies. It oftentimes leads individuals to sexual immorality because they're trying to assuage that hole that is deep within themselves by acting out on that in inappropriate ways. Feelings are powerful and we have to be honest about them. We have to recognize them in ourselves because if we ever try to overcome them or repress them or put them away, then only thing that does is delay the response that we have to them. And the deeper that we push them down, oftentimes the worse the response. Feelings are very powerful. And the good Lord has created us to have feelings. Unfortunately, oftentimes the feelings that we have and our response to them are part of the sinful nature that we have as human beings. Remember, God created us for relationship with God and with each other. That feeling of mutuality, the feeling of love for each other, the feeling of communion, the feeling of community, the feeling that the other individual does indeed help me with my life and my soul development. But because of the warpness of sin, we draw into ourselves and we sense a sense of loneliness. We feel isolated and by ourselves. But Willard goes on to say in his book that we do have because he classifies our feelings, our emotions, sensations, and desires under the category of our mind, that we do have a way to respond. He says we find help from Scripture, not only memorizing Scripture, as he mentioned, for transforming our minds, but also for living in what he calls the five aspects of biblical feelings. He draws these from Galatians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 13. You'll find them familiar because we've talked about them before. He sees peace, joy, and love, which are at the heading of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. True feelings that God gives us and God grants us. True feelings that God gifts us. Fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. And that all the other elements in that list fall from these three, peace and joy and love. He also finds in 1 Corinthians 13, that love chapter where we talk about love, oftentimes referring to it as an emotional connection between two individuals. That love that we talk about there is also a part of that. Notice that love shows up in both Galatians and in 1 Corinthians. Love in 1 Corinthians also with hope and with faith. Hope and faith. Now, brothers and sisters, I think we all know, my guess is we all have experienced, we have all felt that we cannot just conjure up hope and faith and peace and joy and love on our own. Oftentimes, in trying to find those things, 
we lead ourselves to a dead end. But when we allow the Spirit of God to transform us, not only in our minds but in our feelings, we experience the hope, the faith, the peace, the joy, the love that Jesus Christ gives us as we are in a relationship with Him. There's a beautiful story from Luke chapter 10 that I wanted to recount for you just a minute this morning. It's the story that we often refer to as the Good Samaritan. Probably a better name for the story and more biblically accurate would be the Good Neighbor because that's exactly what Jesus is talking about there. Jesus has been teaching on or talking about being a good neighbor. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. When he is asked this question, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus begins telling a story about a man who is on the road. And as he's traveling, he falls to thieves who steal from him, and they beat him, and they leave him for dead. And as he is lying there, a priest walks along. And it says that the priest sees him and goes to the opposite side of the road to pass by. Another man walks along the road, a Levite this time. He also sees the man. He crosses to the other side of the road and passes him by. But then here's what Luke tells us, recording Jesus' words to the crowd. But a Samaritan, while traveling came near him, the man who had been beaten, wounded, and left for dead. And when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, put oil and wine on them, and he took care of him. The thing about this is, there's definitely three motions that are going on. One is this good Samaritan, this good neighbor, sees the man in his distress. He rightly understands what is going on. His mind takes in the information that this man is in a bad way. He accurately perceives what is taking place. And when he saw him like the other two individuals who passed by saw him, for they too also knew the terrible situation this man was in. But instead of doing something about it and engaging the man and helping him, they passed by on the other side. What was the difference between the three? What separated each of them, one acting and the other two not? It's that key phrase in the middle. When the Samaritan saw the man, he was moved, he felt compassion. That's not something we normally would do. There are scientists that tell us that we have this strong desire in ourselves to survive. And in order to be able to put ourselves in a position where we would help someone, put ourselves out for someone, assist someone else, there is something unnatural, supernatural, that has to transform us from the inside out and move us, compel us, help us to feel compassion. That gift, 
It's from the Spirit of the living God. Brothers and sisters, emotions, sensations, and desires, our feelings are strong within us. Oftentimes when we feel something, we react to it in an incorrect way. Maybe we let our old self take over and we respond like we would have last week, last month, last year, before we knew Jesus Christ. It takes time for our minds to be transformed and our feelings to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And yet that is what he offers us. In this story of the Good Samaritan, the good neighbor, Jesus is not any, asking anyone to do and respond in uncritical or unthinking ways. But what he is saying is when we use our thinking, that gift that he has given us, and we see someone, then we will be moved by his Spirit. This is one small example of the many stories in the New Testament where God's Spirit transforms. Feelings are powerful. We know it. We talk about them every day. May God transform our feelings, our emotions, our desires, our sensations, that they be more like Jesus Christ who came into the world and did not look upon us and turn his face away from us but lived among us and took ourselves upon himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life would you please pray with me this morning most gracious God we thank you for calling us to improve our souls by allowing your Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out not only transforming the way that we think, O oh Lord, but transforming the way that we feel. Of looking at your world as seeing it as you see, so that we might act the way you would have us to act. Lord, may we have compassion for the world, not just because of the hurts and the ills and the suffering and the pain, but may we have compassion on the world that needs to know the true answer to its ills. May there never be a soul who approaches death who has never heard of the good news of Jesus Christ. And may we find ourselves in making that wish, that prayer, possible. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This morning we're all invited to the, allow Jesus Christ to transform us more and more into his likeness through our thinking and especially today through our feelings. This transformation and this transition and this renovation is never an easy thing. The Lord Jesus Christ himself likened it uh, to us laying down ourselves and taking up our cross and following him. But it is worthwhile. Because it not only promises us eternal and everlasting life, dwelling with God the Father in heaven, but it also promises to give us abundant life here and now. As we stand and as we sing, we'll be singing hymn number 600. We're all invited to respond.
as you go today, please remember, it's by the grace of God we brought into this world. It's by the goodness of God we've been sustained, even until this very hour. And it's by the love of God, most fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, that we all are being redeemed. May the grace of God